Hello everyone, this is Professor Keen. Uh, today what I want to talk about is chapter 16 of a student's guide to the great physics texts. Chapter 16 of a student's guide, and this is on the topic of syringes, siphons, and suckling infants. And you'll see what this all has to do with Pascal's work in a moment. So again, this is from chapter 16, and the reference here is Pascal's treatise on the equilibrium of fluids. That's what all of these recent lectures have been about. Okay, so let me just say a few things by way of background before I get into the text itself. So by way of background, remember that Pascal had introduced the concept of hydrostatic pressure. And the hydrostatic pressure at some depth in a fluid was given by the pressure equals the density of the fluid times g times h. Again, this wasn't the actual formula that Pascal used, but conceptually this is what he was doing. The important thing is that as you increase the depth of the fluid h, uh, the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure at that point gets larger and larger. Uh, maybe I should say at this point what the units of pressure are. Well, since it is a force per unit area, uh, this can be measured in, if you wanted to use the international system of units, this would be in newtons per square meter. That's in the SI system of units. And one newton per square meter, so one newton per square meter, is one what is called a pascal. One pascal, or PA for short. There are other units of pressure that we're going to come across later on. Let me just list what those are without giving all the conversion factors. Um, so we're going to come across other units of pressure like the atmosphere. Why it's called the atmosphere, well, we'll talk about that more even in this chapter. Um, sometimes also called the bar from barus, that, mean, that means depth. Um, also, another unit would be the millimeter of mercury, and that will maybe become more obvious over the course of this lecture. Also, the pound per square inch, or the PSI, that's another unit of pressure, and also the tor. So those are all units of pressure that one can come across. And remember that the pressure is due to the weight of the fluid above any submerged object. So for instance, the weight of water above the hatch of a submarine, if there's a submarine on the bottom of the ocean uh, and you wanted to open the hatch, you have to lift the water above it. So it's the weight of the water that is causing this pressure. Um, now, the question arises naturally is if, if pressure is due to the weight of fluid above a submerged object, does air itself have weight? And there were conflicting views throughout history on whether or not air has weight. So for example, uh, we came across Aristotle and he writes in a number of his books, for instance, his meteorology and his physics and his book on the heavens, he puts forward the opinion that air itself does not have weight. He says air doesn't have gravity, it has levity. So uh, the four elements that Aristotle and others considered to be the, basically the periodic table of ancient times. So rocks or earth and water themselves have gravity, gravitas or heaviness and air and fire, the other two elements, have levity. That is, they tend to rise. Uh, and that idea was pretty prevalent for quite some time, and it wasn't a ridiculous idea. I mean, if you have a, a helium-filled balloon, it goes up. Uh, and if you have a fire, the, the tongues of flame move upward. So it seems that they behave, at least at first glance, in a very different way than rocks and water do. So the idea is air does not have weight, it has levity. So this is Aristotle's view. And I just say Aristotle, but it wasn't just Aristotle's view, is that air does not have gravity or gravitas. It has levity. And keep in mind that, you know, so even when Aristotle used the term gravity, he wasn't using it in the same way that we do. We don't, you know, we, we've inherited the Newtonian view that gravity is a force of attraction between ten, any two objects. He was using the term gravity to just mean the heaviness of an object. So uh, rocks have gravity, air has levity. Uh, it's, it's also important to keep in mind that, um, that Galileo had some very Aristotelian views on this, but his successor, Torricelli, so Torricelli was Galileo's successor as a lecturer at the, um, the Academy in Florence, fairly famous scientist. That's, by the way, Torricelli, you see the word Tor here. That is one of the units for pressure, the tor, so Torricelli. Um, he believed that air has weight. And uh, this weight of air, so he believed that air itself has gravity or gravitas. It has weight. And he believed that a lot of the observations that were made that were previously attributed 
to nature of whoring a vacuum or nature not allowing a vacuum to form, um, those could be explained in terms of the weight of air. And this is exactly where uh, Pascal picks up. So Pascal develops Torricelli's thoughts. Torricelli's thoughts. And the consequences of the fact that air has weight. And that is where we pick up in chapter 16 of A Student's Guide to the Great Physics Texts is the idea that air has weight and what are the consequences of this. So let's move on. So we're on about page 200 and page 201 here. He begins with the, the assumption that air is heavy. So the assumption or rather the assertion of the assertion of Pascal is that air is heavy. It has weight. Uh, and he gives some experimental evidence of this. So he mentions that if you have a balloon that's not so full, so kind of a flaccid balloon sitting on a scale, uh, and then you fill up the balloon with a very high pressure air, then it will actually weigh more when it's on the scale than when it is not as full. So in other words, he actually was able to empirically measure that air has weight. This is something that Galileo, you might remember in Galileo's dialogues, I'm actually not sure if we read this section. In Galileo's dialogues, he mentions that you can take a scale and on one side put a balloon, and so you can put a balloon on this side, and you, you fill up to different pressures, and then on this side you can balance it with little grains of sand, and you can see how many grains of sand it takes to balance it, and he found that air in fact has weight. So Galileo was aware that air had weight, Torricelli was aware that air had weight, and Pascal was aware that air has weight. Okay, and now what are some of the, where does Pascal go from this? Well, he draws a number of conclusions. So first of all, if air has weight, then our entire atmosphere has weight. So the air that we're breathing around us, our entire atmosphere itself has weight, right? Um, but he mentions, so albeit, so this is a caveat, limited weight. So it doesn't have an infinite amount of weight. Okay, so just as a pool of water has weight and the amount of weight that it has is limited by how much water there is in the pool, so too our atmosphere has weight and how much it weighs is dictated by the total amount of air that there is around the earth. So it's got a limited, this is the atmosphere and it has a limited amount of weight. So that's the first observation that he makes. Um, so what does this imply? It means that we live under an ocean of air an ocean, so to speak, of air, which covers the earth and it presses down upon us, presses down upon us, okay? Why is this relevant? Well, he mentions that um, he recalls some experiments that he had done earlier. So let me remind you of an experiment that Pascal had done earlier. For an analogy here. So let's get some water here. Okay. And suppose that we had a glass tube. He uses one that's like 20 feet long. And on the bottom, he has a little bladder that he fills with uh, liquid mercury. So let's put a little bit of liquid mercury in here. This red material is liquid mercury. And because it's at a certain depth, the height of the mercury, it rises to a certain height, which depends on how deep the water is, right? So compared to this bulb, right? So this would be the height of the water in case one and the height of mercury. You'll, you'll see why I'm saying case one in a moment. So this height of water, let's say if this was 14 feet of water, you would have one foot of mercury because the, the water is pressing down. Oops, the water is pressing down on this bulb and pushing the mercury up into the bulb and it pushes it up until there's one foot of mercury here balancing 14 feet of water. Or if this is 28 feet of water, it would be two feet of mercury, right? So uh, if you were, for example, to lift this out a little bit, so have this less deep, what's gonna happen? Well, because the height here in case two is lower, there's a smaller amount of pressure pushing on this little bladder that's full of mercury. And so as a result, the height of the mercury in this bladder is going to be slightly lower. 
Okay, so the height in case two, I know this is getting kind of small here, but the height in case two is going to be the less, less than the height in case one. So height two is less than height one because H2, so I'll write that here, since H2 is less than H1, right? So that's something that he had talked about before. Now, why is this relevant here? Well, because if we think of the earth, so consider the earth right here, and suppose you have a mountain on the earth, and we live not under a sea of water. I have to make that a little bit darker. We live under a sea of air. Okay. And so if you were to take a tube, I know this sounds a little bit ridiculous, but a really long tube that were to stick all the way down through the top of the atmosphere of air, and you were to put a little bladder on the bottom, and you were to put some mercury in this, it is going to rise to a certain level up in this mercury. I'm, I'm sorry, up in this tube. So remember, the idea here is we have a vacuum of space up here, we have air here, and we have the ground here. And if you were, for example, to take this same tube and bring it up to the top of a mountain, what would happen to the level of the mercury? Well, it would be lower at the top of the mountain than it would be at the bottom of the mountain. So in this case, I'd write H1 here and H2 here. You can probably see the analogy that's being drawn by Pascal. The height of the mercury is going to be higher when you're in a valley because there's a greater depth of air and hence a greater pressure pushing on this bulb full of mercury than when you're up at the top of the mountain. So once again, by analogy, H2 is going to be less than H1 since blue, H2 is less than H1 for air, right? So that is, that's how Pascal explains this, okay? All right, um, where does he go from here? So actually, I guess this was points two and three. If we wanted to stay consistent with Pascal's numbering, let's go ahead and do this. This is one, two, and three. Uh, let's go on to his point four that he makes. Point four is that just as bodies submerged in water, get rid of this, just as bodies submerged in water are pressed on all sides, on all their sides, so too bodies submerged in air are pressed on all sides. So we, living under this atmosphere of air, are being pressed on all sides by the air around us. Okay? And where does he go with this? He says, just as animals submerged in the sea do not feel pain due to the weight of the water. So too, we submerged in a sea of air do not feel pain due to the weight of the air. So again, he's reasoning by analogy, okay? Point six that Pascal makes is that air is compressible. We talked about the notion of compressibility a little while ago, but how does he explain this? Well, again, by way of analogy, he says, just as a pile of wool has a higher density at the bottom of the pile than near the top, so too the density of air is higher at sea level 
at sea level than at the top of a mountain. Does that make sense? And this is because the wool at the bottom of the pile is being compressed by all the wool that's on top of it. So too, the air at sea level is being compressed by all of the water, I'm sorry, all of the air that is above it. And I've run out of room, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause there.